this next week I will have a sign up sheet out. So be thinking about what you would like to bring and how many people would be coming with your family because that'll be here before we know it. Also, only a month out is our in gathering day for Operation Christmas Child. So if you have started great, if you haven't, now's the time to buy and pack. So and we're going to kick off with the, I'm going to give you a little bit of information. This year is the 30th year of Operation Christmas Child. And last year, the 200 million shoebox was packed. That means 200 million children have found out that Jesus loves them. And our area has a motto this year, and it's, Think big, pray big, give big. And our goal for our area is 6,664 6, boxes. And that covers from Shamrock to, per to, me, to Perrington, and I can't remember how far that way. I know that's down the road, but anyway, that's our area. And there's a lot of churches that are involved. So. Think big, pray big, and give big. And today we're going to show a little video, of just a little <laughs> overview, all about Operation Christmas Child. <laughs> The next shoebox is open. They're overjoyed. You can see them shouting, jumping. Woo! Look at how much they are excited. This is their first time. Those children are receiving their shoeboxes. They are so happy. You can hear the laughter. You can hear the cheer. The excitement. It goes and goes and goes. Well, now we're at any point. And today we're giving out the 200 million shoebox to a little girl here. So it's a lot of fun. It's a privilege for us to be able to come and to help the people as much as we can. Every box is important because every box is an opportunity to tell a child about God's love, about His Son, Jesus Christ. There's so much joy that one gift box can give. They really experience the love of Jesus. Every box counts. Every box touches. 
shoebox in the shop. It's like a snowflake. There's not one shoebox that is the same. And we are reaching millions of children with the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you get the heart of the child, you will reach the heart of the parents, you will reach the heart of the family. this morning that we're not just welcoming each other to be here, but that we welcome God to be here. Amen. Yes. That is the reason that we gather. Uh, it's great to see people, but it is even more important that we get to God. So. Okay, December 11th. Emma is having surgery on her back. She wants us to be in prayer for her. We do have business meeting tonight, 5.30. Search team will meet at 4.30. Um, I was going to say something about the Festival of Grace, but Vicki already took care of that. And I know there was one other thing. Garage sale. Garage sale. It's on there. We'll be at the HBC building tomorrow until probably around noon, 1 o'clock, from 9 to 9.30ish to noon, 1 o'clock. If y'all want to break anything up for donation, please, no close. But anything else is welcome. We'll just follow on the <laughs> This morning we have uh, Andy Dietz is um, going to be bring up, bringing our message this morning. Uh, he, he will be back tonight. When he uh, comes tonight, he's going to share about uh, being kidnapped in Budapest, right? Um, and he said, make sure everybody knows and invite people who wouldn't normally come on a Sunday night or would probably even normally come to church. Uh, invite them to be here tonight and y'all guys come back. It's good to see you this morning. Yes. Uh, to have you back with us and, and well, to know the miracle God did to bring you back to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, all right, let's pray. Father, we come into your presence this morning, and Father, we worship you because you are great, mighty, and powerful and awesome. Father, words cannot even describe how great you are. Father, how great your love is for us that even whenever we was in rebellion and sin, Father, you reached out to us and you loved us right where we was at. Father, I thank you that even today, Father, you are a miracle working Father, that, well, Father, even, even bringing Boo back to, to be with us today. Mm -hmm. Father, just uh, lift Emma up to you in the upcoming surgery. Father, that you guide those doctors to do exactly what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Father, I pray for our church. 
Father, I pray for our search team that you would give us wisdom. Father, you would give us knowledge. Father, you would give us patience for your man at your time. Nothing less. Father, I pray for a lost person that's here this morning. Father, I pray Satan is bound and not, not allowed to spread lies, <coughs> allowed to cause distractions. Father, even when distractions do happen, Father, that, that they're not distracted. Father, pray the Holy Spirit remain down among us today. Father, we be changed because we've encountered the living God. Father, we thank you and we love you. In the name of Jesus.
thing with this that you will be off. <laughs>
and I can hardly stand the pain. But into his own design, he is molding me. I know when my world spins on. Just how much I can take when I face the fires again. I'll trust the Potter's hand. He's the Potter on the clay. He knows just how. churches in the last month or so, and this one has more energy than almost every one of my people. I mean, you got to sing, uh, which you should. Uh, I've been to other countries, and we, we sent uh, boxes, just like we are talking about a minute ago, overseas. I got a letter from Franklin Graham that said, your box went to an African country, a Muslim country. It went to a church, a Christian church. The Muslims broke in and stole the boxes. That Christian church went to those Muslims and gave the boxes to them and said, you can have them. We love you. And they started sharing Christ with them. So, the Christ. so the boxes did more than that, that video even said. So know what we do. And that's an outreach. So I appreciate this church doing that as well. But it's good to be here. Let me address first um, Israel. I'm sure it's been talked about maybe last Sunday, but just for a moment. Uh, what's going over there is atrocity. It's a shame what's happening, but it's predictable, and it's in the Word of God. And I believe, as Christians, we need to know we are close yeah. to God coming back. I really believe we're very close. I don't know when that is. Nobody knows the day or hour. We can know the time, the Bible says, but not the day or the hour. And I believe we're living in it. How many of you feel like, even though you may be from Pampa, now, I've got to admit, I'm from Border. All right. And there's several board of people here. Now, stand up, board of people. Wave your hand. Be proud. No. There you go. There's another one. Uh, you didn't know Pampa beat us this year. Uh, about what, one point? Something like that. Uh, I believe, I believe that, uh, you know, God's coming back. Amen. Real soon. Real soon. And we need to be prepared. But the church also, as all of you have been saying, almost every person that's been up here, the church needs to be going out and telling people about Jesus Christ. So bring some lost people tonight, okay? I've shared this testimony many times about my being kidnapped in Budapest Hungary by the Hungarian Mafia. I uh, shared it at children's camp two years ago. There were over 200 kids there, and they listened quiet, not a word. As I spoke, we saw several kids get saved that night. 
So invite friends tonight. I have pictures as well that go along with it. So be here tonight for that. But I think we need to be praying for Israel and for the situation over there. And this is just a sign of the times is what's happening. We need to be telling people about Jesus because I don't believe we have much time left. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 2 if you have the word with you today, whether it's in the Bible or in your phone or whatever. But Ephesians chapter 2, we'll do Ephesians 4 and 3 as well. But we'll start in Ephesians 2. But I wrote this down. It's just a phrase I, uh, God gave me and I wrote it down and I wanted to say it for you. Uh, the church of Ephesus knew about dark and desert seasons. They were in a dark and desert season when Paul went to them and wrote this book to them. Uh, because the church of Ephesus had become so focused on doing church, they had forgotten what it was like to be the church. There's a difference. You can focus on doing church, or you can be the church. That's what we need in the United States of America today. The church needs to wake up and be the church. And not be ashamed. You know, there are people in China. We, we went to China for 20 years. About two or three times a year to China. And led a lot of people to the Lord. But there were 10 girls that we invested in. We didn't invest in the guys because they were always working on the farm with their dad. And they wouldn't go to college. But we took these 10 girls and we sent them to college. And uh, they all came to know Christ. Two of them have married men and they're pastors now in China. One of them told me, said, Andy... We knew when we received Christ, we could be killed or put in prison. And we still did. I wonder how many Americans, if they knew they could be killed or put in prison, would receive Christ. We don't even have that threat. But sometimes we won't share our faith because of fear. Don't let fear stop you. Share your faith. Be out. I don't care if you're 90. I don't care if you're 9. Share Christ. If you know Him, share Christ. If you're still alive, God wants you to be sharing the Word of God. You don't have any excuses. Oh, I'm too old. I can't get out. No, you have no excuses. You have no excuses. My mom was 94 and she passed away. She was in a nursing home. And every time I went in there, people would come in. And she'd say, where do you go to church? <laughs> you know, that'd be her opening line. Then she'd say, Do you know Jesus is your Savior? At 94 years old. I have people all the time walk up to me and say, Your mom's the one that led me to the Lord. Or your dad led me to the Lord. And I want to tell you that's what we're going to be doing. We're in Ephesians chapter 2. Start at verse 1. Now here's Paul speaking to these Ephesians who are basically living a dark life when they shouldn't be. And you were dead in your trespasses and sin. You were dead. They got saved, okay? In your trespasses and sin, in which you formerly walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Who is that? Satan, yes, the devil. They were walking according to the prince of the power of the air, the devil, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Did you know, even if you're a Christian, if you're disobedient to God, Satan can still work through you? Did you know that? We need to be working in the power of the Holy Spirit, not in disobedience. So he's talking to the Ephesians here. Basically, wake up. You're in the dark. Wake up. Then verse 4. This is one of my favorite verses. I put this in my book when I got kidnapped and they had me write a book. I put this, but God. One of them, underline that in your Bible. But God. I don't care what you're going through. But God. Amen. The, the, the Jews and, and Israel are going through a hard time. But God, He's in charge. He knows. No matter what you're going through, but God, being rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, trespasses made us alive. Underline that word. Made us alive. Together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. By grace you have been saved. By grace you have been saved. And raised up, underline those two words, up with Him and seated, underline that word, us with Him in the heavenly places of Christ. We've been co-resurrected, co-ascended, and co-seated with the Heavenly Father. We are there, guys. If you're a Christian... You've been co-resurrected, co-ascended, and co-seated 
in heavenly places. That's what that verse says right there. He made us alive, co-resurrected. Co co he has raised us up, co-ascended, and co-seated with Christ. Seated with Him in heavenly places. Verse 7. So that in the ages to come, He might show the surpassing riches of His grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Now, you could underline that surpassing riches too. This is what he wants to show the Christian. His surpassing riches. And when he shows that to us, we ought to be able to pass that on to other people. It ought to be oozing out of us. His surpassing riches. When they look at us, they ought to say, that person knows God. Or there's something different about that guy. Because we've been co-resurrected, co-ascended, and co-seated with Christ in heaven. Then it goes in verse 8. Here's the gospel. For by grace, by grace, you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It is a what? Gift. Now, a lot of times when I preach a sermon about gifts, I'll have a gift with me. And I'll have a young person come up. And I'll say, now, I've got a gift for you, and I want you to take this. And they'll just stand there like, should I take it? I don't know if I'll take it or not. And they just stand there and say, well, here it is right here. And then eventually they'll take it. But you know what? God has a gift for every person, but they don't have the advantage of it until they receive it. Amen. They have to take it. God doesn't force salvation on anyone. It's a gift. Just like we give at Christmas or birthdays. It's a gift. You have to receive it. Or you can leave it there and never take advantage of what the, what the gift can do in your life. It's a gift of God. So you can't work for it. Then he goes on to say, not as a result of work, so that no one may boast. It's not by being baptized. You know, I baptize a lot of people in border. And the water in border could kill you, but it won't save you. <laughs> it's bad way. And water here, too, is the same way. Because it came from border, Lake Mary, for a long time. Not kill you, but it won't save you. But it's just an act of obedience is what baptism is. After you've believed in your heart and been baptized, that's where the, ver the verb should be, is with the belief first. So we believe in Christ and be baptized. It's a gift of God. For it's not of works as he mentioned most. Christ Jesus for the works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Now I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 1. Ephesians chapter 4. Just go forward a couple books. Verse 1. Therefore... I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in the manner worthy of the calling. Now, he's, he's speaking as a prisoner. He's in prison. Okay? So if you can be in prison and write this, if you can be in prison and still share Christ, if you can be in prison and still be excited about God, what is our excuse? What is our excuse? He's in prison. And, and he's talking about the calling which with you have been called. You have been called. If you've been called and you're not walking in that calling, you're not fulfilling your purpose. No wonder people are miserable. They don't know what their calling is. They don't know what they're supposed to be doing, what their purpose is. Their purpose is to be sharing Christ. But do you know that God has a different purpose in every one of us besides sharing Christ? That's why we have so many different personalities. My wife is a birther. That's her, that's her purpose. You're going to birth her. She likes to have kids. Well, yes, we have four children. We have 12 grandchildren and two greats. But she likes the birth ministry in people's lives. We had like 10 kids live with us in our home when we were in border and, and other places. And their parents kicked them out or something. They'd come live with us. And that lady right there would invest in them. She's a birther. She birthed Christ. In them. I'm a connector. I love connecting with people. And I was very shy when I was growing up. I remember when I was eight years old, we were in Chicago at a big hotel on the lake. And my dad had gone to a convention and took the family with him. And here comes Bob Hope and, and uh, Jean Jean Gabor, and I think, I can't remember who all they were, but they walked up to my brother and I. I have a twin brother who looked just like me, except I was better looking. But uh, <laughs> uh, identical twins. And I was shy and feel woman. And I got behind Mom's skirt, and Bob Hope came up and wanted to meet us. And uh, so did Judge Aga Moore and all these people. I just got behind Dad. I mean, Mom. Phil went over to me, and finally Mom says, go, go. So I went, and I went over and met her. And that shyness, I didn't really realize back then that my purpose is connected. 
we would connect, I would connect with kids and people and Becky would disciple. I did disciple too. But my heart is connected. Her heart is 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 uh, birthing. Uh, we had a lady in our church in Groom, and we were studying purposes, finding your purpose. And, and when we started studying it, I mean her mouth dropped open, her eyes got big. She said, I can't believe this. And we said, What? She said, God just showed me what my purpose is. She said, I am a healer. I'm a healer. And we go, that's awesome. She said, I just registered. I'm becoming a counselor. I'm going to college to become a counselor. She's a healer. And now she's a school uh, counselor at school in Emerald. She counsels kids and adults. We all have a purpose, a specific purpose that God has given us to tell Jesus about people about Jesus Christ. But that purpose can be used through you in different ways. So, in verse 2, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. Underline that. We need to have tolerance with people. In love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Let me stop right there. You know, a lot of times as churches, we can get off on, on convictions. We think one person ought to have one conviction that we have. Well, it's just a conviction. Unless it's scriptural, we can't force that conviction on someone else. Yeah. Had a gentleman who had been a missionary for years, about 20 or 30 years in Brazil. I took a team over there. We, we loved We went over there. He was the Billy Graham of Brazil. And eventually he came to our church in Border. And we had a staff meeting one, uh, staff <coughs> meeting one day. Had a young pastor. He was in his uh, early 30s. And, <laughs> and, and we were about to dismiss for a break. And, and this man said, I want to say something. I said, okay. He said, first of all, I think we all need to be wearing ties in church. And secondly, I don't think we need to do those courses. No one likes it. And uh, the pastor didn't know what to do. He was just, mm. So I said, hey, can I, can I talk to you? We're taking a break. Yet. I said, first of all, the Bible says he looks on your heart, not the outward. Mm -hmm. That's scriptural. That's a conviction you have, but it's not a conviction I have. And I also said, if it says sing, sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs, lift your name up to the Lord. That's scriptural. Now, if they're unscriptural, that's one thing. But if they're scriptural, that's another thing. And so he had some convictions. And man, God, he just began to weep. He said, will you forgive me? And I said, I forgive you. And he said, I want to talk to the staff. And we went in there, step seven staff. He said, I made a big mistake. I had a conviction that doesn't need to be your conviction. It's my conviction. And he said, will you forgive me? They forgive me. I mean, it brought revival to our staff. I'm telling you. And it began to bring revival to our church as well. But sometimes we have convictions. Uh, so we need to learn to have tolerance and love one another and not push our convictions on others unless it's scriptural. You still want to push it. You do it in love. Verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, just as also you were called, there it is again, he's used that word three times already, as you were called in one hope of your calling, there's four times, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all who is over all and through all, and in all in all. We've been called, guys, Amen. to share Christ. God's given you different talents and abilities to do that. Use them. It may just be getting up in the morning and calling some friends on the telephone. If that's all you can do, if, you're, if you can't get out that much or something like that, you have health issues, get on the telephone. Start talking. On Facebook, wherever the opportunities are. I want to look at one more chapter in Ephesians chapter 3. Go back one chapter to verse 16 when I read from there. And while you're turning to that, let me ask you this. With all this in relation to your personality, to your purpose, to what we're to be doing as Christians, what is God calling you to do? What is your story? Do you know we all have a story? We all have a story we can tell about how God changed our life. What is your story? How does God want to use you to touch other people's lives. What is your story? Ephesians 3, 16. That we would grant you, that he would grant you, this is Jesus, Paul saying, he would grant you, put your name there, according to the riches of his glory, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his Holy Spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, you, 
being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, the depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Amen. Now think about that passage right now. Verse 19, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. He wants you to com comprehend what His will is for you. God wants to use you in a powerful way. He wants to use me in a powerful way. Not just be average, but to be powerful. That's what He's telling us here. That's what He's telling the church in Ephesians. He says, don't just do church. Be the church. Amen. Be the church. Tell people about Christ. Bring people to church. Let your story be told to them. Let God use you. We're all unique in different ways. You have a purpose that God wants to do in your life through you. Verse 20. Now to Him who is able. Now to Him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works where? Within us. The power that works within us. To Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. When are we supposed to do that? Now. How are we supposed to do that? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's how we're going to do it. When I grew up, I was at First Baptist Church Borders where I grew up in. And that church had a lot of strong men. A lot of strong men. Uh, I, I played football when I was a little kid. We'd all go out to a park and play. Our neighborhood would play. And so when we got to junior high in seventh grade, the coaches, we started telling them, well, we played football together. What position did you play? So they started putting those, us in those positions. We won every game we played in junior high, all the way up through ninth grade. Like, we won all of our games. And we were all playing the positions because we were so used to each other. The quarterback was my best friend, and I was a receiver. He knew exactly when I was going to turn and where I was going to be. He'd hit me with the ball, and my twin brother the same way. We all grew up that way. We knew that. And, but our coach, when we got in junior high and high school, I never, from the time I, I was in junior high all the way to high school, I never heard a coach cuss one time. <coughs> I never heard a coach yell at a player one time. Never. And we still won They'd tell us about Jesus. They say, you guys need to be in church. We'd love to have you go to church. Some of them taught Sunday school. I mean, they changed my life. They became disciple me. My dad was a Christian. My mom was a Christian. My dad was a good disciple. And he shared scripture with me. And we memorized scripture and all that. But I remember when I was nine years old, a gentleman, we were in RAs. Remember RAs? Yeah. Uh, Royal Ambassadors is a men's field, you know, or a boys' field. And we had probably about 20 RAs in that class. And this gentleman challenged us to memorize scripture. He said, awesome. Okay, I'm going to memorize the scripture. So I came back the next week and I said, Jesus wept. <laughs> that was the scripture. He said, that's great, Andy. He said, but I want you to memorize another one. Matthew 28, 19, 20. Going to all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you even to the end of the world. And guess what? I use that scripture in my life. Another gentleman in that church said, Andy, I want you to read a book. He was in R.A. too. It was called Bill Wallace of China. I read the book, Bill Wallace of China. Bill Wallace was a doctor. And he went to China. He never married. Went to China to be a doctor in China. And he died in prison in China from sharing his faith. I said, I'm never going to China. Don't tell God I'm never going to I went 20 years to China. 20 years to China. Shared Christ. I was at a, last time I went, Becky didn't get to go on my last, next to last time, was next to last time I went. She went on the last one. We went, had a couple that had come to Christ. They said, we want to take you out to dinner. I said, okay. And dinner over there is a lot different than here. It's not like a steakhouse or something, okay. It's more like worms and, and, and stuff like that. Uh, grasshoppers. But anyway, so... So uh, they said, we'll take you to dinner. So we walk in this building. It's about the size of this room. And everybody's sitting on the floor. And it's full. Probably 200 people here. And we're, we're eating rice and stuff like that. You know, pretty soon he says, okay, Andy, come with me. And I got up. And he took me to the front. He said, I want everybody's attention. 
This is Andy Dietz. Everybody started clapping. He had a book. He said, this is the first translation of the Nashi language. We worked with the Nashi uh, uh, minority group in China. There were 300,000 of them. And this is, a, this is a Nashi translation of the Bible. It's the very first one. We want you to have it. Because we know of over 15 churches that have started because of your ministry. We know of over 7,000 people that have come to Christ because of your ministry. And we want you to have it. I wept like a baby. I said, I can't take this. I said, you're taking it. We're going to get more. I had no idea that, that many people would come across in, in that ministry. And maybe more. I don't know. But how does God want to use you? I said, no, I'm never going to China. And then God changed my mind. <laughs> he had plans. What's your excuse? You don't have one. None of us have an excuse to be telling people about Jesus Christ. Here's a border boy who moved to Pamela in May. The wife we were there. Her mom calls us and she says, Did you come over? So we came over and she came out and she said, I'm 90 years old. And I need you guys to move in. She didn't know we were living in a parsonage in room. And we had told, told the Lord, I mean, she knew we were living in a parsonage, but uh, she didn't know we'd been talking about this. And Becky and I had been saying, What are we going to do? We're living in a parsonage. It's going to be hard to find a home with the prices like they are out there. And uh, we just, God just said, I'm going to provide a home for you. And so we said, okay. So we knew that it would be of God if we, if we took another position. Been at Groom for 10 years. And so when we came in, Becky had talked to her a, week, a few weeks before, and she said, I love it. I'm going to church. I'm, I'm at the Benevolence Ministry on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I'm staying busy. I love it. I feel good. And here's two weeks later, we walk in. She says, I want you to move in. I need you. And she said, the house is yours. And uh, we go, wow. I mean, we were, we were taken, we were shocked. You know, I never thought I'd move to Pampa. Right? You know, I never thought I'd move to Pampa. But uh, so uh, we prayed about it about a week later. She said, we said, okay, well, we feel like this is what God wants us to do. We felt sure about that. And I, so it's interesting. I'm going, what's God going to do through me here? I mean, I'm retired. I want to preach. I want to stay busy. I've been, I've been preaching every Sunday since I retired in May. Except for one or two, we've been out of town with the grandkids or something. I said, how's God going to use me? First day, I walked out in our front yard. There's some kids walking by, and I yell at them, and they go, hey, Andy. I'm going, how do they know me? They said, we were going to school at Groom, and you spoke at an assembly. <laughs> and how, what are the chances of that? A hundred percent, if you're a willing witness, and your heartbeat is the next heartbeat of God. A hundred percent. So I've been ministering to these kids in our neighborhood who need Christ. Becky and I have been talking about doing a uh, neighborhood uh, water slide or something like that just to get kids there or have a dinner or something like that in the area we live in here. God's going to use us. He continues to use us. How does He want to use you? What's your excuse? Why is God not using you like He could? In a powerful way. In a powerful way. He wants to use every one of us. Right? I don't think there's an airplane we get on unless we talk to somebody about Christ. A store we go in unless we minister to somebody and open a door. Or a place that we go unless we open doors. God wants to open doors for you and wants us to be someone who ministers. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes for a minute if you want to. We're going to get out plenty of time for some lunch. But you may be here this morning, and, and first of all, you may say, I've, I've received Christ as my Savior. I, I know the Lord, but I, I need to find out what His purpose for me is exactly. And I want to get involved doing what God wants me to do. I want to find out my talents and abilities and giftedness. <laughs> and I want to be able to share Christ using those gifts and those talents and those abilities. No matter how old you are, God wants to use you. If you're still breathing today, God wants to use you as a testimony. Another kind of person who may be here today that is saying, I've never received Christ as my Savior. I mean, if I were to die right now, I don't know that I'd spend an eternity in heaven or not. You can know by the power of God, the Bible says, as many as receive Him, to them He gives the gift to become the children of God. For God so loved the world that He gave 
His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes into the Father but by me. That's Jesus speaking. It's a free gift. Maybe you're here today, and you're not sure, but you want to receive Jesus Christ today. We're going to give an invitation to the Lord. You can come down right here in the front row, and I'll pray with you. Or Alan will pray with you. Someone will pray with you to receive Christ. Maybe you're a Christian, and you've been away from the Lord. You say, I just need to come back. Maybe you need to fill this altar. Just begin praying and say, Lord, use me in a unique way that you've given me. Whatever God may be saying to you, I pray you'll say yes. That your answer will be yes. God, I'll do it. Lord, thank you for this church. Thank you for this people. Thank you for the open worship. Thank you for the hearts that I see. But Lord, I pray you move this way. You move this morning. Then we'll say yes. If it's, it's a Christian that needs to just come pray and say, Lord, I need to know my purpose. I need to know how you want to use me. Let them come and just pray. If there's someone that doesn't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, Lord, help them to come down. Take a step and say, I want to know how to know Christ. Lord, use this time of invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's sing together. The song of the